the major fund of UK research and innovation. Um, and uh, we're really excited that everyone's here to sort of share with us this journey that we've been on for the last two years, which is now culminated in the release of this, re this report paper called Towards a Holistic Migration Research and Strategic Agenda, Integration, Partnerships and Impact. Um, we want to briefly introduce that paper today. We thought as a way of celebrating it as well that we would have a panel with some of our um, key partners front that we've um, been working with over the last couple of years. And then also we wanted to show you another one of our outfits, which is uh, a short uh, or, or kind of um, beta version of a migration research support tool about which I'll explain more later. Before I start, I just want to go over a few logistics. We have a lot of, we have over 90 people registered for this event. So we know that usually about half of those actually turn up still. Um, we're, it's a lot of people. So it's not really possible to keep everyone's uh, microphones on and have that kind of an interactive discussion, which we would love to have had if we could have been in person. One of the, I guess one of the benefits of us being online has been that we can include people from around the world from all of these different conversations and those we haven't been able to speak with so far on this kind of virtual platform. But it does mean that we have to kind of work things in a slightly different way, which is um, to keep people's microphones muted and um, with the exception of the panelists who will be speaking, you'll be able to see uh, videos there. Um, we'd ask you to keep your video switched off if you can, just for the bandwidth, uh, if you're not a speaker. Um, and, but we still really want to hear from you and we'll be facilitating uh, Q&A discussions using the chat function. So along the side, the, the right hand side of your screen, you should be able to see uh, the chat function. Um, if not, then go down to the bottom of your screen and click on the chat bubble um, and write your, write your questions as they come up. You don't need to wait for a person to stop speaking in order to write your question. We're looking at it all the way, all the, all the time, and whoever's facilitating that particular part of the program will be putting questions together to, to set to the speakers. So please feel free to take part in that, uh, you know, to contribute in that way. We should also make, uh, make you aware that we're recording the whole presentation, including the chat function. So just be a little bit careful about not sharing uh, information that you're not happy to or that others would not be happy to share on a public space. Um, we hope that's all right, that we're recording it. Um, we want to make it available for people who, because of time zones or, or business or other kinds of uh, schedule, scheduling issues, are not able to be with us live here today. I think that's about it. Um, let's, let's get into the, the program. Um, first of all, I wanted to introduce to you our team. Uh, some of you, many of you have been part of at least one of the migration conversations that we've been holding over the last couple of years, but for those of you who haven't, um, I'm Laura, I'm the head of the team, um, with, with, together with Kavita Data and Elaine Chase. Uh, Kavita is at Queen Mary University of London. Elaine is at University College London in the Institute of Education. Um, Helene Tummers is managing our slides today and our, uh, she's our Zoom master, I guess we would say, um, and has been supporting the project, as well as Luisa Brain, who's our project coordinator, and Jennifer Alsop, who is not with us, but has been with us for most of this journey. She's now moved on to take up a position um, at the new Migration Institute at Harvard. So we very much consider her still part of the team. Next slide, please. Can we see the next slide? Can you see the next slide now? Aline, are you there? Yeah. Um, I'm going to just go into the next slide then. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. In it. There it is. Sorry, that's all right. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, no, back, back a slide. There you go. Um, we want to just kind of orient you to the work that we've been doing. Um, we're, we were commissioned, uh, we won a competitive bid from the research, UK Research and Innovation, uh, led by the Economic and Social Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council to develop a shared strategy for migration research. The idea being that the ESRC and AHRC um, could, could usefully look at the synergies between their different migration research portfolios and try to bring them together, but also try to look together at where there were remaining gaps, either geographically in terms of subject or in terms of the ways in which research got funded. So we, that was our first kind of brief. And we decided to turn that into really a research question. 
uh, and a research process. We thought we could, you know, we were all migration researchers, we could sit in, in our offices and uh, in the UK and, and write such a strategy, but it would be much more interesting and richer if we could um, take a few of this kind of puzzles that we see and bring them to a wider audience um, by hosting a series of migration conversations throughout the world to focus on these key areas. And I'll get into the more the substance of those, but we were really motivated by wanting to know what do people think about some of the divisions that we see in our field between migration and forced migration, between research in different kinds of geographies. So South Asia has a particular kind of a dynamic as does East Africa. How do those, what do those different dynamics look like and how do they relate to each other we're really interested in. We wanted to understand more about how the arts and humanities and the social sciences work both individually as well as together and how migration studies, which is largely by definition uh, uh, an interdisciplinary subject, how it, it engages with those other disciplines and what are some of the issues that arise when that kind of meeting of disciplinary backgrounds comes together. We're also really interested in the ways in which policy and practice work together. I think we can say that most of us involved in, in migration studies have some sort of policy focused outcome as at least if not the primary reason that we do the research, then, then a real key kind of sub objective of the work that we're doing. And we wanted to see what kinds of innovative uh, ways of having policy and practice, of engaging with policy and practice could be found in, in the body of uh, research that's going on there. So the migration conversations involved um, artists, researchers, um, policy makers, practitioners, whole museum curators, a whole range of different kinds of people to try to get, bring out the richness of those, kind of, of those kinds of questions. And so that's why in the video we explained that we thought we saw this as an experiment in co-production really from the start. We've at every stage tried to encourage this feedback that goes on between um, members within a room when a conversation is happening, but also from one conversation to the next. Should we go to the next slide? Um, we, started, we started off our conversations in Delhi in um, 2018 and in rapid succession we've been to um, I think 12 different places. So we were at in Beirut, Brussels, Delhi, Glasgow, London, Medellin, Colombia, Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, New York, Thessaloniki in Greece for the International Association for the Studies of Forced Migration and Barcelona for the MISCO conference, which is more of a kind of migration policy oriented conference. And each, each conversation had a slightly different flavor, depending on the kinds of issues that its participants are engaged in, the kinds of things they're thinking about, the challenges they're facing, um, and the makeup of, of who came, who was in the room. Uh, so as we mentioned, that was this really quite wide ranging uh, group of, of people who are taking part each time. We also had these kind of feedback loops where we have reports on each of the, the meetings, which you can see on our website. We provided those back to the participants of the conversation as drafts and they, they fed into them. We also tried to have a kind of thread that went from one meeting to the next so that there was some kind of continuity and there was someone who could say, well, um, you know, the last time a conversation was held in, in Medellin, for instance, now we're in New York, we can, we can have some discussion about what what was discussed there and how does that maybe influence some of the conversations that we're having at the next meeting. Next one. In having these, in all of these conversations, we had sort of three main uh, focus areas of focus. One was around substance. We were looking at what are the gaps and the priorities in migration research. Um, they were, it was about kind of what what kinds of subjects are newly emerging? What kinds of things are less, have less research going on in them than others? What are the interesting areas in which there are clusters of research that are happening where we could, in a sense, capitalize on or, or benefit from, uh, from bringing together and sharing those experiences and amplifying the effect of uh, the kinds of research that's going on. So that was the first goal of the conversation. The second was to think about partnerships of all sorts of different kinds, to think about how we might strengthen and build better interdisciplinary, international partnerships, how we might think about early career researchers maximizing the opportunities and benefits they have from working with more seasoned, more experienced um, researchers, how to 
try to break down some of the, the divides between so-called researchers and practitioners, if you like. Um, so a whole different series of ways in which we've been looking at partnerships and trying to find more equitable ways of working together and trying to really to use migration studies as almost um, uh, a trailblazer to try to think about more broadly ways in which international research can be worked on more effectively and more in a more collaborative nature. Um, so we'll have more to say about that when we get into the discussions about the paper. And the third thing is really about thinking about how to bridge the divide between migration research policy and practice. As I already mentioned, this is really something that I think most researchers, migration studies researchers go into, but we wanted to see what are the opportunities and what are the lessons that can be learned from the ways that's being done in different parts of the world. We also, along the way, uh, wanted, did some experimentation with um, using the arts to create, to generate impact. And so we worked with our friends and colleagues at Positive Negatives, which is a, a small um, group that's, that works on research-based ideas to turn them into artistic productions, whether they're comics or animations or films or something like that. And so we did um, what was new for them as well, a stop motion animation called Life on the Move, uh, which turns into a very short uh, film. And we entered it in the AHRC Research and Film Awards and it won for the best social media film, which we're very pleased with. There's us at the uh, award ceremony. And at the very end of this whole uh, launch event, we'll send you out by playing the, that video in full, which is just the three or four minutes long. Today, just wanted to talk about what the plan is for today. So we are wanting to present to you the strategy really briefly. The strategy is right now going on live on our website. And uh, if it's not up there yet, it should be by the time you, we're finished with this event. Um, it uh, is quite, of course, it's long, it's rich, it's got a lot in it and it's, it feels um, like we're cheating it a little bit to just talk about it in a few minutes. So please, I really would encourage everybody to go and take a look at it and let us know what you think. We've done lots of feedback consultations with um, all of the members of the network that have participated in conversations as well as a special event here in London with people who were new to the process. Um, but we're still wanting this to, to spark a conversation and we hope that it will continue, we'll continue to receive feedback on it um, and, and generate discussion as we go forward. So we wanna do that. We also wanted to celebrate this network. This network now includes more than 450 people who have physically sat in a room with us and participated in, in these conversations. And many more who have read, who have engaged with us on social media um, and who have been following the work of the team. So we asked four of our colleagues to join us in a panel discussion. Uh, Ranabir Samadar from the Calcutta Migration Research Group Catalina Sanchez from the Museo Casa de la Memoria in Medellin, Alexander Olenikov from the Zolberg Institute at the New School in New York, and Ala Shahabi at the University College London, who is also part of a major um, funded, ESRC funded center called the Relief Center, which operates out of Beirut. Um, and we'll ask them to just give us 10 minutes of thinking about some of the challenges and major themes that they're facing, that they're dealing with and thinking about in migration studies right now. There'll be a chance for some, some back and forth, um, some interaction and, and question and answer. So please, as I said, write your questions in the chat, uh, chat boxes as we go along. Um, and we will um, take you through a little bit as well of this um, on migration research online tool that we have in very few minutes. Um, and just briefly say something about our, our plans for the future. So um, just wanted to, that's a kind of by way of an introduction to set things up uh, for where we're going now. And um, I'm going to hand over now to Kavita Data, who is going to talk us through the strategy paper. Thank you. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, I love it. And hello, everyone. I hope you and your families are well and safe. So as Laura said, I'm just gonna provide a brief overview of the migration research strategic agenda um, that we're launching today. So in terms of um, the overarching aim or the ambition of this agenda, that is to inform the direction of migration related research across the social sciences and the arts and humanities in the UK, in Europe, and in other countries in the global north and the global south. And we provide a framework for considering um, the thematic priorities and migration research funding, 
the effective promotion of more equitable and efficient research partnerships and pathways to effective impact, both for researchers as well as for UKRI to maximize the engagement with and the impact of its migration research portfolio. In terms of um, methods, a range of methodological approaches and tools um, underpin the strategic agenda, which are grounded in the principles of collaboration and co-production, which were very important in the ways in which we framed this whole um, um, project. So we undertook a review of existing ESRC and AHRC migration research portfolios, um, and we did this alongside discussion with the key informants um, at both of the research councils. We, heard, we held 13 uh, global migration conversations that um, Laura was speaking about. And the three key strengths of these, just briefly to reiterate, was the number of people that we were able to consult with, um, so some 450 participants. The diversity of these participants in, 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 in relation to the fact that we had academics, practitioners, policymakers, and representatives from migrant and refugee communities in each of these conversations. Um, and finally, the fact that in each of these conversations, again, we had new, rich, and embedded and situated sort of dimensions um, to discussions um, that were held. We were able to secure um, additional funding through the course of the, of, of the project um, to host a workshop in Johannesburg um, to establish um, core principles for equitable partnerships um, in, in, in relation to migration research. And the Johannesburg principles, as they're now called, are uh, included in the strategic agenda. And we also, throughout the whole process, um, did a review of literature on migration research and policy. So to ensure that we had feedback at all stages, we held a workshop to discuss draft versions of the strategic agenda. And we also received deta detailed comments from several peer reviewers and from the AHRC strategic advisory group. So what you see before you today, or what you will see very shortly, is a thoroughly vetted um, agenda. Um, in terms of the uh, key recommendations, these are divided into three sections. And the first of these um, relates to thematic priorities. Um, and the cross-cutting priority of the strategic agenda is to support research which offers innovation in relation to four dimensions. The first is to advance conceptual understandings of migration and mobility. The second is to expand the geographical foci of research. The third is to promote interdisciplinary collaborations, especially where disciplines are not working very well together, or not very working very well, um, or not, sorry, not working together very often. And fourthly, to break new ground um, and or to promote methodological risk taking. And the substantive thematic foci which have emerged in relation to this are around um, uh, issues such as who migrates, why people migrate, how migration is experienced, with a specific emphasis on education and health, migration and securitization, international relations, governance, and methodological um, innovation. With regards to equitable partnerships, we promote or we recommend a reflexive approach to partnership building. Um, and this requires, we argue, a collaboration at all stages of research, from agenda setting to research design to, research, to resource allocation and distribution. In order for this to be realizable, for equitable partnerships to be realizable, we need further investment in professional development and capacity bridging. When we talk about investment, we need to think about investment in time, which is what we really need in order to build relationships as well as an in investment in resources. We need to promote a meaningful engagement with migrant communities, and we need to have a fair, fair allocation of resources and recognition between the arts and the social sciences. So our key recommendation to the research councils in relation to equitable partnership building is to build institutional capacities and research leadership and to offer technical advice to support applications. Finally, in relation to impact, we recommend that research should have clearly identified desired impacts, that we should enable different partners to work towards different impacts, or different impact outcomes across disciplines and across geographies. So that's really important to recognize the diversity of impact goals within um, a particular research project. We need to engage with a wide range of stakeholders, again, right from the inception of the project that was reiterated again and again through the migration conversations and as well as and, and, uh, through the other workshops that we held, that we need to think about impact from the start to the finish. 
We need to allocate adequate, adequate resources in order to realize impact and project design. And we need it really sort of importantly to recognize the potential of arts-based methods to reach new audiences. And here our, re our key recommendation to the research councils was to ensure adequate funding for impact related activities. So that's really a whistle stop tour of the, of, of, of the strategic agenda. As Laura said, it's, it's, it's much more um, detailed and much more nuanced. Um, and we would encourage you all to, um, to, to have a look and, and to have a read through it. But what we're going to do for the next 10 minutes or so is to just um, respond to some of the issues that are coming up or to engage in some, in some kind of conversation um, through the chat function. Yes, yeah, so I'm unmuting the team. Wait just a second. Yeah, Louisa, you should be able to speak. Hi. Um, so we'll go into the Q and A now. So um, if feel free to type into the chat function and we'll pick up your questions. Um, the first one comes from Patricia. Um, thanks for your update. Um, Laura, I wonder if you want to uh, comment on Patricia's um, note around more funding towards the Global South as a place of knowledge and not only origin of migration. Um, so I'll hand that over to you to speak to you if that's okay. Sure. Uh, thanks, Patricia. Um, uh, as you, you know, probably most peop most of you and in our conversations have we've tried to make clear that we're really interested in having more um, research funding made available in a variety of different ways in so called developing countries and and with my hat on as the Global Challenge Research Fund um, challenge leader on displacement, I can say that that's a major focus of GCRF. Um, activities. So GCRF money comes to um, UKRI, but it's part of the UK's overall 0.7% of its budget uh, that should be given to development. So as much as possible, the, the spirit of that money is that it should be spent uh, abroad, in, uh, in, not just abroad, but in countries of, that are the focus of development. Um, and so there are, you know, that, that includes doing more research in those places, but it also um, accrues to the questions of um, who does that research? How are budgets structured? Who are the principal investigators? Who are the co-investigators? What kinds of research uh, structures are fostered? And so if in the report we talk a lot about the need to um, kind of decentralize, if you like, decolonize research budgets, um, so that much more of those financial resources and responsibility and, and the structure of these uh, research endeavors is um, kind of devolved to the, the places in which research is being done. We're also really key, really eager that this network that we've set up shouldn't just be about people in different places talking to us in the UK. It's also about different people in different places talking to each other across those spaces. Whether it involves us or not doesn't really matter in some ways. So the idea that our colleagues from Calcutta can speak uh, directly to our colleagues in Nairobi or in Medellin is, is that's a signal of, I think, the success of this network. I think it goes beyond just the, the strategy paper itself. Um, but it's a really, really good point and I, I hope that it comes across as a very strong um, kind of thrust of the, the paper that we've put out. Thank you. Um, so the next question is more around partnerships. So Kavita, I might ask you to answer this one. Um, and that's from Lisa, who is um, commenting on, on partnerships um, with those faced with resource constraints, such as language issues, um, as well as the challenges of facilitating South-South knowledge sharing. Great, thanks, um, Louisa. Language issues came up um, repeatedly, um, uh, Lisa, throughout the, the, the conversations, um, both in terms of sort of um, the different uh, uh, issues in relation to translation, um, but also in, in, in relation to our, the, the fact that our knowledge production is very much based upon or, uh, or premised upon um, uh, literatures that are written in English. 
um, and therefore sort of the, the the lack of access that that northern researchers also have to 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 literatures that are written in different um, in, in in other languages apart from apart from English. So that is definitely something that is taken up in the in in the strategy in terms of the importance of including, for example, funding for translation. Um, and for sort of thinking about the language that underpins knowledge production and what that means in terms of the limits to the knowledge that is there, that, that is thus produced. And therefore having these kinds of collaborations that are north south, that are south south, open up bodies of work to all of us. And so they increase all of our collective kind of capacities to engage in really engaged and nuanced um, work. Thank you. Um, the next one is a comment from Mukta in who, who works on internal migration in India, um, who has experience you, uh, working with migrants themselves um, in research. Uh, and yeah, something we comment on in the report is this as well. I wonder if Elaine, you wanted to speak to that point. Um, yeah, sure. So methodological innovation again came up hugely throughout the different conversations and that was a place where we could really think about the bridging between the arts and the social sciences um, and I think it was in relation to not just modes of engagement but who gets to be involved who gets to have a stay the types of um, methods that can be used to engage people more widely and engage a wider set of constituents of people and also that people have cho choice over the modes of engagement in research as well these are all sort of themes that came out throughout our conversations really really important point and something that we've really pushed for in in the strategic agenda and i think following on from that point um a comment from Shashi around, I guess, the challenge of, of doing this kind of innovative um, work and kind of meeting requirements for quite time bound um, projects. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything or if we move on. Um, so the next one is around knowledge sharing um, from Paolo. So um, this is around which questions are important. So tensions that might arise between questions that we might have around who migrates, why they migrate, versus more policy focused questions um, migrants and asylum seekers have themselves. Um, have we experienced this tension? Um, Laura, I might hand that one to you to answer if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Hi, Paolo, uh, my colleague at SOAS. Um, uh, certainly, it's a really important question. I mean, uh, I think you can, uh, there's a, you know, it's hard to speak on behalf of the entire migration studies community because we all enter into it with different kinds of interests and objectives. And we know that some research lends itself to policy change more than others. Some is not so much driven at that. Some is, is as you suggest, really about trying to understand the process of migration, wh whether that has a policy outcome or not. Um, it's still an important research endeavor. And so we've, yeah, we have tried to um, speak to that and also to, to make sure that in our recommendations about what should be funded, it's not just dictated by what are the hot policy topics. It's also about what are the key questions that researchers feel need to be looked at, uh, whether or not they then have lead to a, a potential, you know, final, um, sort of research application, if you like. So if you're doing, what if you're an archeologist and you're doing research on the you know, prehistoric uh, migration patterns, is there a, a policy output of that? Perhaps, but perhaps not. Perhaps, I mean, perhaps what's really interesting there is just understanding what those processes were as a contribution to the field of, of archeology span and migration studies. So, um, and there are many, many other kinds of examples. Uh, but but hopefully you know there should be this should be a broad uh, tent under which a lot of different kinds of research um, can can will recognize itself in the ways in which we've characterized it. So I hope hope that you'll feel that. But I hope you also come back to us and tell us what you think of that. Should we move on to our panel discussion? I want to make sure we have enough time for for the, the contributions of our colleagues. Okay. Great. So um, it's my great pleasure to, um, to be chairing the panel today. Um, Laura's already introduced our panel, but in terms of running order, so they're all going to give some reflections on this, uh, the, the state of sort of migration studies from different vantage points. 
We're going to start with Ranabir Samada from the Calcutta Migration Research Group. Then we'll move on to Catalina Sanchez Escobar from um, Musea Casa de la Memoria Medellin. And then on to Alex Elenikov at the Zolberg Institute on migration and mobility in the, in the New School New York. And then on to, finally on to Ala Al Shahabi from UCL's Relief Project. Um, so if we can start with Ranabir, each of our speakers will speak for 10 minutes. Um, as Laura mentioned earlier, if you've got questions, if you can feed them into the chat space, that would be great. And we'll pick up those that we can. I'm going to have to be very strict on time because um, we have a limited time. So each speaker will have just 10 minutes and then we'll move on to the next speaker. And then we'll pick up the questions at, after all our speakers have, have given us their contribution. OK, so Ranabir, big welcome. Can I hand over to you to please start? Yeah. So good afternoon to everybody and uh, uh, participated, participating to some extent uh, in the global conversations of the migration leadership team. Uh, I benefited a lot and uh, I recall it because uh, as I was listening to the reports and your reflections, um, I mean, I am still having conversation within myself and with myself as to what the present crisis means for uh, those who do migration research and by which i mean the pandemic or the or the epidemic and uh, what i shall do in these 10 minutes is to maybe signal three or four points which i think uh, uh, force me to think of my work or other work others who are working probably in a somewhat new light. And therefore, I shall very briefly comment on four, three, four points. One is that uh, we have always seen that, you know, refugees and migrants, uh, we always think of it in that manner, and that's the right way to think. And at times, we think that we understand the refugee condition probably better if we have a good idea of what migration is all about, forced migration, etc. But on, on other occasions, we think that the migrant situation is better understood once we have an idea of who a refugee is and what a refugee-like condition is. So in some way, we are back to the Hanarin's whole idea of the human condition. What is the condition? Uh, which perhaps because legally and all that divides uh, uh, the groups into migrants or forced migrants and refugees. But in the situation that we are in India, where let us say by a conservative estimate, at least <coughs> let us say four to five million people are stranded and they are trying to reach their, uh, you know, destinations, their points of origin completely shut out by conditions of lockout and reports are coming out each and every day i'm quite sure the world is aware of what is happening in india it's an unprecedented thing and and people are noticing that after partition we never had such a kind of you know uh, you know long trip of the migrants and they are crossing 1500 kilometers 1200 kilometers so i was invited a few days ago to write a paper on the root causes and i wrote back probably I shouldn't have used such a direct kind of bit of a rude uh, a, a reply in the sense that I'm not interested in the root causes anymore, even though I've worked on it, simply because can you ascribe crisis to some root cause? The way we always think of root cause schematizes our migration research in a manner that doesn't take into account the whole notion of crisis. So while there was a comment I was hearing that, that people have thought that probably we give too much importance to crisis and we should have given importance to let us say structural origins and all that but i do think that crisis is something like a brick that gives us a window that offers us an opportunity as a social scientist or for that matter intellectual activists to look at migration completely from unanticipated light so that would be my first comment where i still think that the crisis also enables us to see in India what we are happening is a surge of solidarity, different kinds of, uh, how would you put it, militant philanthropy at grassroots level across the length and breadth of this huge country, exactly what you saw in your continent, in Europe, I mean, in 2015, 2016. 
you can't understand it uh, from a gradualist point of view. You have to have the idea of a break in the whole process of 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 uh, 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 these kinds of uh, you know migratory acts, where the migrants actually claim autonomy and they speak with their feet. The fact that they come out in millions and the fact that they then are ready to die, ready to uh, you may have heard of all the reports, actually give us a new meaning to the whole idea of autonomy of migration. And I am completely aware of its conventional meaning, the discussions and all that. But I do think that crisis actually lends to the concept of migration, to the act of migration, a new meaning and new historical significance. So that's number one. Number two is that I was also thinking, and I was in a way questioning myself, why did I not give the question of public health, the importance that it deserves in understanding migration. And given that I am coming, uh, I stay in a post-colonial uh, country, uh, I am aware of the colonial history, yet we always connected migration with famines. We connected migration with direct state, colonial violence, etc., etc. things which are uh, known to any good researcher. But why is it? that a public health crisis never featured in our work prominently. And whenever we talked of public health, we talked of refugee camp and public health, health of the refugees. In other words, there is a public health and there is something to be discussed on refugee health or issues of health, et cetera, et cetera. So we assume that migrants are not part of the public. And the way this whole idea of a public health is a very bourgeois idea that has developed, that developed let us say from the 19th century. In India, uh, if you see, and uh, I have been now, have started working on the Plague Act of 1896, which, you know, which was triggered by the outbreak of plague. And in those days, it actually uh, you know, uh, provoked a migration of about 300,000 people. And today we have a public health crisis, which is being managed by the Indian state through a law and order approach and not through a public health approach. And the approach is based basically on the National Disaster Management Act. It's available online. You can see why I'm saying that the dominant approach to migration control and migration regulation has been law and order, even when a crisis appears in the form of a public health crisis. And I think we have to work much more on the whole question of public health to see how this idea of the public the way it develops actually excludes or differentially includes different groups. They could be minorities, they could be refugees, they could be migrants. And public health suddenly has become one of the most, how would you put it again, the critical, you know, optics or the very crucial window through which you can see what is happening in the society. The, the, and, and public health crisis, I mean, again, this should have been uh, you know, uh, uh, discussed by us with um, its deeper significance. And had we done so, I think migration scholars in India, even though I must say they have, you know, uh, uh, risen up to the occasion, we are trying to do what we can, but our theoretical and intellectual preparedness for whatever was coming should have been much more. I think the third point is that, and this is the, I will end in another two, three minutes, which is that. I mean, I am recalling Foucault's Discipline and Punish, where Foucault has this great chapter, The Great Confinement. Foucault actually speaks that how in the 16th century France, when the plague breaks out, what does the government do? And if you look at the description of Foucault or other kinds of writings of the time, or even, let us say, Thucydides' own work on the Peloponnesian War, again, you will see governmental technologies have changed, but they haven't changed much. In a way, the way migration was tackled in a 16th century town in France and the idea of Foucault, that the idea of confinement and refining governmental technology, techniques of surveillance, techniques of disciplining people, confining people, supplying them with food items and punishing them if there is a plague victim in the family, etc., etc. We can go on and on. And Foucault says, that the governmental technique to control leprosy and the governmental technique to control plague were different in some ways, where I, 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 I join issue with him. But I think that there is so much to learn from him in the sense of the historical continuity 
of governmental techniques to control and regulate uh, 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 you know, migration and people who are on food. And my last point is that in all these, migration is something which you know, invariably compels you to be an amateur geographer, even if you aren't. But on the other hand, the notion and the, and the, and the idea, which is almost a naturalized idea, that borders and boundaries are created by migration and mobility has something to do with the boundary making exercises. Again, I think should be, uh, you know, uh, inquired into deeply, precisely because in this case, when we are thinking of mobile diseases, actually the term mobile diseases is, is, is uh, how would I put it? It doesn't justify uh, itself because we have to see it from the other point of view. Why do we call a disease a mobile disease? And what makes it mobile? Does it because cross, it crosses a national frontier boundary? Is it not with that within a country diseases are always mobile? And the idea that a virus in its effect can be homogenous, is standardized, seamless, that it would have the same effect that it had in China or for that matter in United States or for that matter in one state of India. Uh, uh, and it should be, this actually is a very political concept. And I'm reminded with which I shall end, is that this in this great book, The Emperor of Maladies, which is a history of cancer, the author actually writes that a disease first wins politically in order to win medically. And I will end here. Ranavir, and some really, um, am I, can everybody hear me? Some really interesting reflections, I think, on the on the, on migration studies in the context of the current crisis. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a plug to an amazing collection of work that Ranabir has coordinated with colleagues at, at the at Calcutta Research My, um, uh, Institute, which is available online and an amazing set of reflections on the on the current crisis. And, and, and the impact on, on migrant, migrant communities and, mig and the implications for migrant research more generally. I'd really, really recommend it. I'm gonna pass over swiftly now to Catalina Sanchez Escobar. Um, welcome Catalina and over to you, thank you. Hello everybody, thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be sharing these small ideas here with you. Uh, I'm the director of the Museo Casa de la Memoria, House of Memory Museum, which is in Medellin, Colombia, and we have the pleasure to hold the last year conversation. And today I just want to invite you to three small things. So I think in, in listening to Ranavir, I think it, it is very important to invite people to use the techniques we discuss in the migration conversation in our actual crisis and, and the importance on using the outcome for what is happening right now and what is next in our context. And also, I think that it's very, very important to make a connection between experiences and situation in different continents and see how we can learn about each other. Making a small reference about what has happened in Medellin and one of the big issues I want to expose and which to us very important in the Latin American conversation is how we need to think in long-term solution for IDPs and how these measures need to be extensive to the new Venezuelan immigration context in Latin America. Uh, well, what's interesting in, in Medellin conversation is that raised several migration related issues of a specific importance to Latin American region among the synergies and differences between internal and international migration, environmental and development uh, induced migration, and questions of terminology surrounding victimhood and survival, and how this plays out over time. But what was very, very important, and, and, and I want to concentrate on this idea, is how some key thematic strengths of knowledge production in the region, which were rise related to the question of history and memory, bringing arts and culture to the general public to have a discussion about migration and its many forms. 
and also the importance of translating the value of the region's main rich normative and conceptual instruments into international uh, discussion more Broadway. And, and I was taking what Laura was, uh, has said before about art and culture as part of the research. And, and this is, I think, is, it, this is the main idea that we want to share uh, today. Because actually, uh, for the conversation, we made a, a migration laboratory. And, and we thought about it as an open space to bring together college students, young leaders, artists, and cultural managers who have an interest in migration issues. And the idea was to uh, get a work and let them to have a better understanding of the community's perception about different types of migration using an interactive methodology. And also what is very, very important is that it also aimed to gather this opinion and perception as well as allowing the attendees to have a horizontal and conversation and a, a participatory dialogue with academic and practitioner experts on migration. And these artistic practices were used as a tool to help people to generate and um, proper discussions and reflection. And I think one of our main ideas here in all the conversation that we have here is how we link art and culture to the research and how the issues or their results are really, really useful to take in account for experts and for policy makers. Uh, I think that in our migration conversation and, and for uh, uh, we need to use social media, our practices, and digital content. And also, we need to think about new impacts of our outcome in terms to have an impact beyond the academic and policy sector and get into people which are related to migrants or even migrants themselves. And I think this is very, very important for us to have organization and academia united, but also to hear the migrants to understand what they are really having, uh, having or living. In Latin American case, migration issues are linked with the lack of material condition of, the de of development of public services. And in Colombia particularly, migration, especially IDPs are connected with the reivindication of justice, true and reparation in a context of armed conflict. And right now we are dealing that with, with culture and with art. So we think that it is important uh, to think in terms of migratory studies to introduce and to take account how art and culture can help us uh, to, to increase and, and to understand more. Also, it is important to talk about the importance to have an active participation of the migrants in our action. We need to involve them as an active part of the discussion and the goals. And in addition to that, we need to create political social initiative that allows them to have a visibilization of their voices and concerns, giving the example of what we do, for example, in Casa de la Memoria Museum, that we are always sorry, working with, with community. I think that migration research does not just require us to count migrants and document their experience, but also to explore how migration shapes communities and uh, vice versa. And I think that uh, to finish with my intervention, because what, what I wanted to do was having the ideas that Rana Day said before is how all what we have discussed, can we put it into practice in, in, in nowadays uh, crisis? So how COVID crisis make us to, uh, util to use well, all the techniques and the methods, but also to invite researchers, experts, and policy makers to take into account um, arts practices needs to be integrated into projects rather than include as an ad or an ad to communicate outcome. It's not just a way to communicate our result, it's a way of creating new knowledge because as we have experienced, the art allowed us to talk about what is hard to say. And it's a way to express not only our feelings, but also the experience that can help us to understand what's going on and what really is needed to know and to be applied for uh, the migrants. Um, and just to finish, I think that is, um, 
I think that we have to ensure that the integration of our practices with proposal is reflected in both the budget and research design, that the contribution of artists uh, to research is fully recognized and acknowledged sometime in research outcome and publication, and that artists and, and culture outputs can be benefited from deep and reciprocal engagement with the research. So, um, also, I think that foster a strong collaboration in the region between arts, culture, and knowledge are very useful. And here in Latin America and in the Middle East, I think that uh, the idea and the relation that we have with culture and we are for us and how we think migration help help us to make some cultural links stronger is an invitation and a reflection that we want to invite you from what we have said at the conversation in the Museum Casa de la Memoria last year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catalina. I think that's such a nice overview of the, of, of the way that the arts have been used, the modes of engagement, democratizing participation, and raising these big questions about what is impact? What is the research that we're doing for? Who is it for? These are really, really important questions. In the, in the discussion feed, there are questions raised about how we can actually widen the ideas that you've implemented in, in, in Medellin to, to other contexts as well. So hopefully we can pick up some of that in our discussion. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna hand over to Alex now, Alex Elenikov from the Zolberg Institute. Many thanks, Alex, for joining us. Over to you. Well, thanks to you. I'm really delighted to be here and congratulations to the team on really a, a remarkable report in terms of the worldwide consultation and the comprehensiveness of the topics that are discussed. The Zolberg Institute was pleased to be you know, one of the sites of the meetings. We were able to bring together uh, scholars and also members of the New York arts community, which is a very vibrant community, of course. Uh, I, I want to make just a uh, comment on two topics here, although there's so much to talk about in the, in the report here, but let me start with just two. Um, and I want to think about the word mobility. Um, the, so the title of the report towards a holistic migration research strategic agenda um, makes sense because we define ourselves as a set of scholars interested and policymakers interested in migrations and scholars and activists in the field see this movement we see it everywhere some of it for some of it voluntary but we see it as a constant in our world some people say it's what it means to be human is to be able to move and to move Political philosophers talk about migration as a fundamental right of a uh, fundamental human right. Um, this has led some people to begin to talk about a mobility bias in our fields, our various fields. And I, I want to say here that I share this concern that we sometimes lose sight of the fact that the vast majority of people in the world don't move. Uh, and not because they can't, but because they don't want to move uh, for obvious reasons. They want to be close to family. They want to be in cultures that they are a part of and grew up in. They want to live with religious communities. They want to have jobs related to work that others have done. So for all these kinds of reasons, uh, you know, 95% of the world's uh, population uh, will never cross an international border to move elsewhere, and a very large number won't move very far from their uh, initial home. So we need, I think, to focus on this vast majority of people uh, who don't move. Uh, migration studies has to think about immobility, both enforced immobility, which can be quite harmful, but also the choice uh, to be uh, immobile. And I think the report, I'm just pulling a sentence out of the report that says it would be Better, uh, beneficial to understand better the motivations and basis of decision making of those who decide to leave and those who decide to stay. And obviously, I'm underscoring that point. Now, th there are obviously policy implications for the fact that many don't move and many choose not to move. And I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I want to think more about this conceptually in the following way. So I start with the assumption that's borne out by the research here um, that the decision to move is largely a decision to improve one's or one's family's economic situation. Those who move, move to places where they can do better, where they can find a job or get a better job, where they get higher wages, where they're gonna be part of better systems of social protection. It doesn't mean people don't move because of conflict and fear and those refugee movements are, are substantial, but the vast majority of people who actually choose to move and live elsewhere do so for well-being reasons, for uh, economic well-being. 
Um, so from this, I mean, you could see movement as an exercise of a fundamental right, the right to move to where one can live a more robust life. But I want to flip this a little bit uh, and say that I see increasingly, I'm thinking about movement and mobility uh, as a marker of disequilibrium in the world. And what I mean by that is that if we really had a world without great social injustice and without great global inequality, which in fact is our world, far fewer people would seek to move because they would be, as we say, generally want to stay where they are and comfortable and able to take care of themselves. But movement is largely a function of these great uh, inequalities around the world. And from this perspective, borders are not just a limit on the human right to move, to settle anywhere because we all possess the earth and common in some ways of our humanity. But I view borders primarily, their, their function is primarily to preserve privilege. That's why we have borders, is people who have want to keep people out who may want to come in and benefit from being in that society. So it's a, it's a different view, I think, of, of borders, perhaps, than, than the way we, we talk about them somewhat. Now, there's a danger in thinking about it this way, that that leads, obviously, to people saying, oh, so immigrants are coming to take our jobs or to get social benefits from our generous welfare state, and we don't want to do that. But really what people are saying there is, we don't want to give up our privileges. It's a rec Those kinds of statements are recognitions of the privileges that borders uh, protect. And the answer here is, um, is I mean, one answer that we hear sometimes from uh, the advocate community is, well, actually, all people crossing the Mediterranean should be seen as refugees, and they're actually forced migrants, and et cetera. But, uh, and even, I think, in the, the movie that showed up front here, we, we need to show that migration is actually a, a largely mixed flow from many kinds of motives. And the argument then would be that migration benefits destination states, as, as much research um, uh, dem demonstrates. I guess the phrase I would use here is that migration really is an opportunity multiplier, both for those who leave and for the places uh, they arrive in, and actually for the sending, sending states as well. So I try to flip this in two ways. One, the first see migration as uh, the, an indication of immobility, uh, I'm sorry, uh, of, as an indication of disequilibrium, but the actual movement itself is a, an opportunity multiplier. The second point uh, I'll do quickly here is related to the first, um, and it goes to the new drivers of migration, which the report talks about. Ron Beer briefly mentioned that we're going to have to add COVID probably to that, that list. Um, we can, I'll probably say something about that in the questions, but, but I want to talk here about uh, the effects of climate change. And we know that hundreds of millions of people are going to move uh, due to environmental events over the next uh, few decades, uh, much of it due to the climate uh, crisis. Now, Movement due to climate is different than the traditional refugee flows we're used to that are based on con conflict and violence in a couple of respects. Um, uh, first, it, it's more likely that through um, important measures, we can actually help people stay home who want to stay home. It's difficult to do that in situations of conflict and violence, but with, with climate, there actually are adaptation uh, measures that could be taken and resilience measures that could be taken that would help people stay home despite the fact that climate is changing around them. And this implicates the role of development actors uh, more uh, in, in terms of thinking about root causes uh, than, um, than has been done in the past. Secondly, uh, we know that most of the movement due to climate uh, will be internal. Um, that's true for some re refugee flows as well as a lot of t twice as many IDPs as refugees in the world. But it also means that the refugee system is not the best place to think about this new kind of new driver of uh, migration of, uh, of, of climate change because it's largely going to be uh, internal. And thirdly, most important, and this is what ties to the first point here, is that there's an obligation of the international community to develop a system and processes to assist people who will be moving. And we don't have that system now. We have the climate discussion is broken into sometimes it's a refugee issue, sometimes a migration issue, sometimes it's put in the bucket of uh, the climate change research uh, and the UNFCCC. And, and there's no central place, there's no one agency, there's no set of norms or practices that handle a climate mobility uh, as a whole. 
Um, uh, and why would the international community have a particular responsibility here? I think it goes beyond the general view that the international community should step in when there are humanitarian crises around the world, as it does when there are earthquakes or, 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 or large refugee flows uh, due to, con due to um, conflict. And, and then the reason is just this, is that most of the people moving, most of the people adversely affected by climate change are living in countries that were not responsible uh, we're not for the causes of the climate change. Those are happening largely in the global north, elsewhere. And so you have a, a part of the international community creating the harm that is falling on people in some of the, uh, the situations we're least able to deal with that. And in that situation, it seems to me, there's an, a responsibility, an obligation of the international community to step in. And this way, I mean, it all goes back to this point I made in the first point that we're living in a world of great global uh, inequality, that movement is a function of that inequality quality and the structures that maintain that inequality. And part of that inequality has been states that have been able to uh, develop and uh, create these increases in CO2 levels that are having impacts um, elsewhere. So if the first point is conceptual, the second point, I end really with a policy uh, recommendation here that, that the international community needs now to think hard about what kind of international structures, processes, maybe in support largely of regional structures, uh, can deal uh, with this coming environmental mobility. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alex. That We covered a lot of ground there, but I think something that what your contribution has captured is the shifting nature of migration studies, the, the, the constant need to rethink things conceptually, rethink things at a policy level, and rethink things methodologically as well. Um, and, and we've tried to sort of capture some of that, that need for flexibility in, in the strategic agenda, but it's a, it's a big challenge. And I, I, we, we constantly need to be on our toes rethinking how we approach these things. So thanks very much for that. And then finally, I'm going to hand over to Ala, Ala al Shabi from the Relief Center at UCL. Welcome, Ala. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Elaine. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, inviting me to speak um, with such a wonderful panel. And congratulations on this report um, that's very thorough and um, I'll point to sections of it that I thought were particularly worth uh, noting. Um, I work in the Relief Centre, which is a five-year multidisciplinary project um, funded by the ESRC focusing on um, prosperity in Lebanon in the context of mass displacement. Um, you may know that Lebanon has quite a large population of refugees, about one in five. Um, and the way this project was curated was uh, thinking about displacement as context. So it's not a refugee project as in just focusing on refugees or, or the refugee condition. It's focusing on general prosperity and development in Lebanon and displacement being um, a feature of um, the current global system. So it's, it exists. How do we then think about the development in a context where people are forced to move. And in that sense, we think of displacement, we talk about displacement more than migration and expulsion, you know, to Ekeo Saski Assassin, that expulsion is a feature of um, the relocation of labor and resources around the globe. Um, and with increasing climate change, of course, um, that, that, that migration is, is, is this condition or a feature in which we have to think about everyone's prosperity and everyone's development. Um, so Relief has been a particularly interesting project because it's long term, I mean it's five years, it's rather large. Um, we have uh, around 25 researchers and, and that space and scope allows us to have uh, take an experimental approach with our research. So we have architects, social engineers on the team, anthropologists, educationalists, um, and we're running lots of programs and these programs are, uh, are inclusive, so they include everyone, both Lebanese, and uh, non-Lebanese, whether they're Palestinian refugees who've existed in Lebanon in camps um, as, as refugees since, since for over 70 years, or the more recent wave of um, refugees that have come from Syria since 2011. Um, and in that sense, Lebanon as a country has always had to deal with a refugee, a refugee influx. Um, whether that's a crisis in the sense of a crisis is something else if it's all, the crisis is recursive is that a crisis if it's always if it's all if it's always there if wave after wave of refugees um, are moving because of um, capitalism because of war because of colonial rule because of neo-colonial rule and so on um, so in that sense uh, 
re relief is sort of held up as, as an example of this kind of project that takes a broader view on refugees and uses displacement as a lens into wider, wider problems in society. Um, now, having said that, I want to just point to a few features in the report and I, what I particularly liked was the focus on not just understanding the context of migration, the, the, you know, the who, what and the how, but changing the terms of the conversation, changing the terms of collaboration um, and how we conduct international research, how we partner, how, who we work with and understanding that with these with funding and with these kind of collaborations there's an inherent um, level of inequality that gets expressed within these kind of international projects um, and in that sense i thought the report was really good in highlighting that and this comes from kind of a, a particular wave um, in the uk which is to think about decolonizing the university decolonizing research and what do we mean by that and this then comes to the root of what knowledge production is within these kind of global collaborations, which is fantastic. If you have, you know, the way funding is, is moving into encouraging global collaboration, moving resources from, uh, that's being sort of um, uh, channeled through higher education to, the, to other countries in the global south that they're working with, this I think has forced us to really think about how do we become equitable within our own research practices. So when we also then come to think about impact, impact then becomes about the research process itself, the process of knowledge production, as well as the outcome. So it's not just a summative, it's not just what are we gonna produce at the end of this project, it's also about how we do our research. And in that sense, I felt the report highlighted certain elements um, of a decolonial practice quite well, um, issues around uh, acknowledging and recognizing inequalities, power inequalities, capacity inequalities, when you want to partner with, with someone in the Global South, where they're an institution that may not have the capacity to deal with the bureaucracy and the paperwork and the administration, I thought that was kind of really good to point out. And it's something that we face in practice. Um, and the fact that the research is, all, is sort of always curated and designed around the Western University schema, um, that it begins here. And then we think about who do we add as partners um, that I think the report has highlighted, I think in the course of your conversations, how that practice is sort of changing or needs to be encouraged by donors um, as an issue to think about constantly. Um, on that front, I wanted also to add, particularly bringing it back to the current um, challenges we're facing at the moment, even though, you know, uh, migration is, is, is a sort of mode, is, is, um, is a mode of our condition or a, a reflection of our human condition. Yes, we are facing a global crisis at the moment. And what does knowledge production mean for us um, in the face of the current uh, global pandemic that we're facing? And here, you know, to echo Stuart Hall, crisis can be a moment of reconstruction. This, is the, this, is, this has forced all of us to stop and rethink our research. Um, it, you know, in the beginning we froze, we thought, you know, what can we do? What could our, what could our research possibly do to help anyone in this situation? To rethink about what impact is, how, what is my role as a researcher to bring about positive change in, in the current, um, you know, quite debilitating environment for everyone. And to understand that in, in the countries in which we work, it's particularly difficult at the moment. Um, you know, in, in Lebanon at the moment, with a million people in refugee camps, particularly um, the question of hunger, the question of um, uh, energy the, and water and all of these things are being exacerbated. So the current crisis is, has, brought, has, has worsened an already difficult and challenging situation. So we've had to really kind of rethink our, um, uh, you know, we've paused, we, we had to rethink what, what, we're do, what, we were, what we're doing and actually what do we need to continue? So a lot of the work actually gets kind of sort of, um, not necessarily reconfigured, but rethought, but re-emphasized. Um, so one of the projects, for example, that I was working on um, that got stopped was um, how conducting a citizen assembly on the energy transition. So this, is, this was highlighted when you have a longer term project that allows you to experiment and think about things as emergent to act and change your research uh, kind of agenda around the, the, the issues that emerge. So one of the issues is energy. In Lebanon, you know, 40% of the state deficit that's really has caused its bankruptcy I would say at the moment um, and a currency crisis is the fact that you know 40% of the state budget is going to fund energy subsidies. So um, it's already it's also energy for example is a topic that affects everyone. I mean uh, people living in refugee camps are not even connected to the national grid. 
so what does it mean to be off grid how do people then have the means um to get basic services uh you know water food energy things like that um to meet their quality of life but this is also a problem shared by the lebanese themselves so we were planning to conduct an assembly for example um which got halted the need for it is still there we just can't because of the situation at the moment and how do you then begin to have a public space and a public sphere and a public conversation online digitally if that physical presence is is uh, muted and um and doesn't exist for the time being at least i hope it doesn't last too long for everyone's sake um but other other really good examples for example we were always running an online um online moops um online courses which our team at the institute of education um uh, have been designing and particularly when this lockdown happened the relevancy of that became even more apparent and urgent so we've been running courses on how do you run course online courses so i mean even though we were running courses on other topics now it became you know, training people at the lebanese university on how do you run online courses and finally um, in terms of this collaboration um, it's what do you do in times like this where for example even our partners are really struggling AUB which is the strongest university in the Middle East you know it has a revenue of 800 million um, one of the oldest one of the strongest is is, is facing a 60 percent revenue cut you know the colleagues that we partner with always had long-term contracts of themselves facing precarious situations they, we don't know if they're going to have a job by September um, within a month, they'll be announcing major cuts. So in that sense, you know, where where it's a difficult time at the moment, it's very, very difficult. And institutionally, this pandemic is going to have major implications institutionally for us. And so in terms of kind of donors, it will be how do we reconfigure our funding to, 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 to address this challenge? Thank you. Thanks so much, Ella. I mean, that really captures some of the real time challenges um, of conducting research and collaborative research in the current current context and being able to respond to those. And how do you respond to those collaboratively, you know, as well? How what's the kind of process of just deciding and defining how we respond? Um, these are really, really important questions. There, we have very little time and there's been an amazing um, discussion going on in the chat. So I'm just gonna pick up a couple of the questions that, 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 are, that are coming out, but the transcript of this discussion will be available along with the, with the uh, recording. So people can perhaps pick them up and continue the conversation. There are a number of questions that relate to, um, and uh, perhaps I'll, I'll pitch this at you first of all, Catalina, um, that relate to the arts and participatory engagement and how you can shift away from things not being tokenistic. So the arts, yeah, everyone loves the arts. But how do you work in a way that really unsettles power structures and modes of engagement and participation? Actually, what <clears throat> we can talk about the experience from the museum because this is the way we work. Uh, all the contents we do at the museum talking about victims, actually it's a memory museum from the Colombian conflict, but from the voices of the victims. So we visibilize all the victims and their stories. So uh, what we wanted to do at the laboratory uh, last year was to introduce this methodology and the techniques we normally use. And, and it's really a real, a real participation. We are always working with community. If they are victims, if they are migrants, it depends on the subject we are working on, but we can do it. We are doing um, sometimes with our workshops or we do lab labs. Or we can do also some uh, fo uh, focus group, and we are always taking their testimony, their experiences into account. <clears throat> and some of the practices are after being part of the exhibition, because as the museum, we do some temporary exhibition. And this year, for example, it is about migration, forced migration. And we are starting to have this kind of conversation. And well, now we are doing it virtually, because normally we do it in, in, in physical and, and we do some surreal art workshops. But uh, our experience from the eight years we have been working uh, with, it is very, very useful and, and everything we can uh, learn from them and, and you can see it in the publication and in the exhibition is is just to to learn how to do the technique and how to involve really the migrants and the arts and the culture practices 
in the research and how you have to be clear of what do you really want to, to have and to ask and then let the, the art flow and, and show but artists and but and not also artists but organization cultural organization and artistic organization the more of them uh, not all of them are pro professional I have led us to learn a lot of things so I think the idea is is just to gather them, to talk with them, and and to make uh, together what, like the project of what we really want. And and for us, it's not it's just not symbolic. We really work with them, and they see themselves reflected into our researchers or our, our exhibition. So, the first is, is the trust. So you have to to have a really a strained relationship. So it's not something you just call and and have them to answer your to request, but it's it's also to start having all this close relationship and start working with them, having discussion and, and spaces where they really can express and you can really learn and win a lot from the experience. And we can we can have this discussion and share our experience from the museum, but we while we tried to show you last year, show us that it really, really works that way, having into account and, and making them a real participant of the elaboration and the research itself. Thanks, Catalina. They're really good points. And, and talking about the kind of length and engagement, these aren't one-off sort of snapshot chats with people. It's, it's very much a, a kind of investment in time and, and, and resources over, over a period of time. Great. Um, one of the questions that's come up in the chat is, um, is the crisis an opportunity to rethink the notion of public, of, or of the public from the perspective from the perspective of migrants or migration. And maybe Ranabe, you might like to respond to that one. Uh, I think it's a very significant question. And uh, uh, my brief comment would be that yes, crisis is a kind of window to understand, but the methodological implication of uh, this idea is that we have to also unpack the notion of the crisis itself. I mean, if you take the way, again, in India, but elsewhere also, you know, to the extent I get reports, that governmental response to, to, the, to what you can say as a public health crisis has been broad ranging from financial reforms, structural reforms, uh, bureaucrat administrative reforms, everything. Why is it so? Partly because the health crisis is always posed before us as a crisis of life and crisis of the entire nation, entire society, which is preceded significantly by a massive financial crisis. So you can see that states almost everywhere will now use this, the public health crisis to address quote and unquote other crises. So when I said crisis, I meant that we have to understand the significance of the whole idea of conjuncture of certain things, conjuncture of certain moments, that then produces what we call a public health crisis. And the, the other comment linked to that is that, again, it also speaks of the method that we use in our research. Why is it that certain things to which we were at, used as, you know, acknowledging as, as I said, gradual and almost natural presence in our life, but why is it that something which is called public health and if you uh, divide this phrase into public and health, you find that actually it has now one of our other competing notions, let us say community health. I'm not saying community health is a very great idea or it's a better idea than public health. But a genealogical understanding of this whole idea of public health, which now faces a crisis. So it's not merely a crisis of our own lives, but it's also a crisis of this whole idea of public health, which had been institutionalized in several ways whether in India or for that matter in European countries, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is important to understand the notion of break in our researches, the idea that a genealogical mode of understanding the colonial roots and how the Indian state, as far as India is concerned, this idea of public health begins, we eradicated malaria. Malaria was the greatest scourge. Millions of Indians died each year and the most massive migrations happened. So I will end with recalling, in fact, something when I was reading those remarks is, for example, Mike gave us this fascinating book about the late Victorian Holocaust and the making of the Third World, where he speaks of the Elinofemines and then the 
kind of plague outbreaks and the malaria outbreaks from 1870s, 80s onward, and then releases massive migrations. He speaks of China and India and I think Brazil. But India and China, these are the other thing that I recall very well. And so what is it that lends health to a notion of crisis and therefore the challenge to the seamless idea of the public we had got used to? We only thought, oh, refugees had to be included in or the camp has to be clean, or they have to be given access to certain things. But we never interrogated the notion of public health itself. Thanks very much, Ranavir. I don't know about anyone else, but I could carry on having this conversation um, for the rest of the day. But unfortunately, we are out of time now. I hope we can, you can continue the conversation. We're going to talk about continuing the network and uh, engagement uh, later on um, before we close. But, big big thank you to our panelists and for all their input and for all the discussion that's been going on it's really really fascinating thank you thanks great thanks thanks elaine and thank you to all of our panelists you uh, makes me miss these conversations that we've been having and want to start them all over again um, but and also it really is a great um, advertisement for this network to keep it going and to keep these conversations going so we'll come back to that in a few minutes. I wanted to just really briefly before we finish up share with you another product that we've been working on um, with a team of um, website web developers uh, which is one of the things the challenges that we faced as we were looking at UKRI's massive portfolio of funded research projects is trying to figure out what actually fell into our remit. So we developed this tool to think through and to help navigate UKRI's migration research. And this could be useful for the councils themselves, of which there are several council members on the call here on the line, but also for researchers. So right now, for instance, there's just recently been announced a GCRF um, agility call on COVID-19. So if you are thinking about applying to that, you might want to know what else is going on in this space, what else is going on with regard to economic migration, refugees, whatever it is. So I just want to take you through this um, really briefly and see if this maybe helps. Um, it is not yet public, so you're getting your very first view of it. I hope you can all see it now. Um, but it will be, it will be uh, publicly available on the UKRI website very soon. So um, this is just a, a, a quick, really whistle-stop tour through and, and we'll let you know when the link is up and you can play around with it yourselves. But what, we, what this tool enables you to do is to um, do a bunch of navigation. So here by theme, by geography, by discipline, by funding, and by the, the lead councils. Uh, and you can do that in a variety of ways. It, it sort of cross-tabulates itself. So here on the um, on the left side, obviously, is the graphical representation of what you're looking at, which are migration themes. These are keywords that when people applied for grants, they, the, there's usually a place that says, what keywords would you identify with your project? And so the words that people put in are the words that appear here. Um, so if, you want, if the first question will be, why isn't this word in there? It's because it hasn't been identified as a keyword by an applicant. Um, on the right-hand side is, is a, a variety of different kind of cross tabulation category of variations you can look at. So theme, discipline, country, region, uh, status, whether it's active or it's a finished product, lead council, funding mechanism, the years. So I'm not going to go through all of that, but I just wanted to go through the major tabs here um, just to show you in a way how something like this could work. So if I wanted, for instance, to look at um, all of the projects on uh, demographics, I could just um, go here and then um, click on this. It will give me all the different, different uh, subcategories and then even within that, the list of the different projects. And again, if, if you click through with this, which I'm not going to do now, it'll take you to um, a brief summary of the project that was supplied by the applicant when they, when they sent in their application. Um, another way of thinking about that is to look at the geographical spread of the migration research portfolio. Um, in this case, you can go to a particular country and I don't know why the zoom isn't working. It is working, it's just slow. Um, and find, oops, find out for instance, since I've got it right in front of me, what's happening in Egypt and it will tell me what, which two projects uh, related to migration are taking place in Egypt. Um, and you could pick multiple countries to, as well to see. So if you're working in Colombia, for instance, we were in Colombia and we 
thought that there was, this was an under-researched area and we found there are actually quite a lot of um, UKRI projects that are being funded there. So, um, which doesn't mean that that's not a, a reason not to keep funding, but it's a great reason for those who are involved in research um, in the same places, perhaps on different themes to possibly come together for certain things or for researchers on similar themes across geographies to come together. So it's a way of trying to help um, different, yeah, to create different sub communities within migration studies. There's also uh, a focus on, on discipline. Again, this is a massive list of disciplines and this is just because these are the boxes people tick when they, when they check, uh, when they apply for, um, for grants. But so just to make it simpler, let's just um, click on anthropological, anthropological um, uh, categories here um, and it will just show you a subsector that within the migration portfolio there are these 22 different projects uh, which are related to anthropology um, that which may be useful if you're an anthropologist or if you're not an anthropologist and you're looking to make linkages with with people who are in that field um, this is a kind of a grant uh, a distribution of the different funding that is uh, associated with migration um, you have to take numbers a little bit with a, a pinch of salt just because um, what counts as migration funding, what, some of it will also account be related to climate research or to conflict research or to uh, labor studies more generally or whatever it is, but you can um, play around with this and you can separate it out by different councils or different areas. Uh, again, I won't do that, but just to sort of show you what's, what's possible here. And then uh, the final thing is the lead councils. And these here, um, the only tags uh, for the, th there are seven research councils, but three of them uh, tag migration projects, ESRC, AHRC, and the, what's called the BBSRC, Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. So within that, you can see, you could click through to looking at these 222 projects, but you could also sub, you could define it down um, more more into um, a, a different a set of you know just looking at demographics for instance what kinds of things are funded by which kinds of councils so that might be useful if you're thinking about you have an idea for a research project and you're not sure which council to apply to in their open call round for instance you could see that AHRC and ASRC both fund a whole range of different projects related to migration and demographics so that might be a suitable place to to look so Again, this is really just a really whistle stop tour of this, this tool. Um, I should give a shout out to Claire Heffernan, who's the head of the London International Development Center, who first gave us the idea as we were applying for this grant. Uh, I think it was a great idea and it's still just got a couple of little bugs that need to be worked out, but then very soon it will be uh, publicly available. Um, and, and it's potentially could be used, uh, it could be expanded into other areas as well. Um, I'm not gonna, I won't open it up for a discussion really about that, but if you have specific questions about how the tool works, you can certainly get in touch and let us know. We're just about out of time, but I wanted to say something about um, our kind of uh, plans for the future. So we've finished our, our funding under this grant, but we really feel that we've created a really strong network, which has so much potential to be used in a variety of ways. So we're looking at, different kinds of funding sources that the migration leadership team itself might apply for in combination with some of uh, our partners in the network. We'd love it if partners themselves found other sources of funding or other kinds of activities that they could do together that might involve us. But as I said previously, it doesn't have to involve us. Um, and we you know we will commit ourselves to keeping this as a sort of space for people to get in touch with each other to contact each other and hopefully to collaborate with each other uh, in a variety of ways and and so if you're uh, willing to stay part of the network uh, we'll continue to keep in touch with you um, we also want to really thank the economic and social research council the arts and humanities research council and the london international development center who made this collaboration possible it's been a really wonderful experience and um, we've all learned a huge amount from it. And just being on this launch uh, call today and seeing all of the different people who have um, checked in from around the globe who've been part of this conversation makes me miss everybody even more and, and really look forward to future collaboration. 
Um, so I just wanted to thank all of you who are taking part in this, this uh, process with us, this experiment. I hope that it leads to really heightened uh, research, more equitable research, um, new exciting research opportunities for us and for others to work on together. Um, and, and that's really what I wanted to leave you on. Um, we did want to just play out, as we said at the end, we're just officially out of time, but we're going to finish off by just playing the video that we won our social media award for in uh, research in uh, arts, um, uh, sorry, research in film awards um, this year. So we'll just play off that last video as we say goodbye to everyone. But please do keep in touch with us, stay involved in social media and let us know what you're up to. And we hope that we'll be able to um, continue to engage for the coming years. Thank you. Even though I was born in Yemen, I was of Somali heritage and was always treated as a foreigner. It made me want to volunteer to help refugees. But soon, the same kids who had bullied me became refugees themselves. I left with my family, boarding a boat for three nights that was built for 40 but carried 350. I just worked in a cafe with my father. And that's where I met my husband. He came in for an Americano and left with my heart. After 25 years in Finland, I decided to return home. I opened a dialysis clinic that serves my whole country and region. Some of my generation still don't feel they belong in Europe and want to return home. Life in my village was getting critically hard, so we left. And one night, my eldest son disappeared. A smartphone is why he left. His friends in Europe sent beautiful pictures. I'm glad I don't own a smartphone. If I did, the Libyan kidnappers who took my son would send videos of them hurting him. I could not live seeing that. As a single mom, I struggled to bring up my kids and being a minority wasn't easy. So I decided to return to my motherland. There are many reasons migrants move and many different destinations worldwide. Migration is not a problem unless it is unsafe or forced. In fact, human movement has occurred throughout history, showing our determination to thrive. To find out more about innovative research in migration and displacement studies, and to learn how this animation was produced, visit our website. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Right.
Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much, everyone. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye.